you all for coming. We'll get started now. And um, thank you to Victoria <coughs> Finley for gracing us with her presence today, tonight. I'm quite excited about having her in. And we'll get started in just a moment. Um, there's um, the book is for sale, to say, and, and at a five percent, five percent, five pound discount. And with it, I don't have it. There's, there's a tea towel. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. It's a nice tea towel. It's it's got it's got the color illustration of Paul et Virginie. That's how the French say, I'm sure. Uh, in repeat on it. And it's not just a tea towel. It's an organic, fair trade tea towel. <laughs> not that this doesn't make it sound like an ad for some uh, supermarket or anything like that. Um, so uh, we could uh, actually we could get. Get started and just could ask uh, to uh, Victoria to read a little bit from the book. We sort of picked out a little passage to give you the flavor of it, and if you wouldn't mind, mm. and then we can get into talking about it. I mean, just before I start, I just want to say it is actually quite a funny story how I come to be sitting here because before Christmas I came in, I raced, raced in, I was seeing, was going to see a friend. I asked you for a book. Um, a book recommendation. Oh, we've got somebody coming in. Oh. Hello. Sorry, please. Uh, yeah, that's okay. We'll just, uh, you make your chair well. I asked you for a book recommendation. You gave me a brilliant book recommendation for this friend I was going to stay with. And um, then I presented my 10% Author Society card and you said, what have you written? And normally I'd be extremely proud because this had just come out. But actually I blushed because of course what I've done is what every author and every publisher does, which is go to the bookshop <laughs> where there was the single copy of the fabric <laughs> and place it on the table, neatly done on, on, a, on, a, on a stack of books that could be your own and leave it there. And I knew, I knew after I'd admitted it that you'd, you'd go over there and you'd see exactly what I'd done. So it was in a whisper that I, that I admitted it. <laughs> do, do you know, it's, you're, not, you're, not, you're not alone in that. Uh, I had, um, well, no, a couple of years ago, Tracy Chevalier, and the way that started is she was in Winchester doing research for her book, Single Thread, and she was in the shop, and I had known her from Eve, and she came over with her selection, what my colleague was helping her with, and one of them was Mothering, so Grant Swiss Mothering Sunday, and I mentioned, I said that was one of the better books I had read in the year, and she said, oh yeah, and she walked over to the table where <laughs> the edge of the orchard, the book edge of the orchard, says, what about this one? I said, it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> But that eventually, that eventually, we got on all right after that. Eventually, got to being agreeable to come in and do, to do it. So at least I didn't do that with, with you. <laughs> so um, Bob's asked me to read this bit, um, which amused me because it, it is one of the examples of me being slightly hopeless at the making side. Uh, but there's two introductions that I want to make. Um, first of all, I am at, in Guatemala at Lake Atitlan, which the Mayans believe is the navel, the, the, the connector to the other world. Um, and um, I have, I'm looking actually for a weaver, but I found this woman whose name is Dominga Perez Celada, and she's 89 years old and she's sitting on on the floor in a kind of and she's spinning she's got a spindle like the ones that i've just seen at the <coughs> winchester at the winchester city museum and she, with a stick through it and a weight and she's spinning cotton into thread um, and i think oh maybe before i go and find the weaving for which this area is so famous i think it could be time that i learn how to spin and this is what happened and just before we start as well there's one paragraph which starts the cotton chapter the co um, and I'll just read that because it comes up in a second so on the 13th of August 3114 BC the maize god created three stars in the constellation of Orion later he built the four corners of the cosmos and set a tree to grow through its center when everything was ready he set the stars and the planets and the Milky Way in, moment, in motion, and at that moment, time began. So, he spun. So. 
To say turning to describe Dominga's use of the spindle makes her action sound pedestrian. Dominga dances it, she gives it life, and as the spindle turns, as if by its own momentum, a strong thread follows. I've seen hand spinning before with wool and linen, but this is different. One difference is that wool grows as individual hairs on a sheep's body, spinning it out is like returning it to its nature, and linen grows as the stem of a plant. It also wants to be in lines. But with cotton, its nature is to be a mass, a soft bed for seeds. Spinning it is not returning it to anything, it's transforming it. Dominga hands me the spindle. Now you take it, she says. Strange to think that a few generations ago, picking up a spindle would have been as natural for me as picking up a pen. I'd have understood the balance of the thing. I'd have known its quality. This is Dominga's spindle. I'd guess it's a good one, but my fingers feel clumsy. This is an unfamiliar world. I think of the maze god teasing out time, but if his thread were anything like the one I'm mauling my way through, then we're in for a very short cosmic ride <laughs> indeed. <laughs> Within two centimetres, it's broken. It has to turn, Dominga says. It has to turn until it makes sense to pull it. She resets it and hands it back. It breaks again. I'm using the wrong side of my brain. My left brain says, let it out slowly, concentrate, make yourself do it right. Why can't you do it right? But my right brain knows that I'm concentrating too hard. Stop concentrating, Dominga says. You have to understand the thread, but not by thinking. You'll know, you'll feel when it's going wrong. But it's always going wrong, I think. I try harder. Outside, the sound disappears. It's me and the thread and damn, it's broken again. <laughs> Mold it between your fingers, she says, sighing at my ineptitude. When it breaks, you have to connect it back to the centre. And she shows me again. And again, and again, and as I keep on trying, I realise how natural it must have been not very long ago for most of the human world to use spinning as a metaphor, for turning chaos into order, muddle into line, and for making something that can't be unravelled out of whatever was there before. I stay so late that there are no public boats back to Panna, and I have to find the only hostel high up on a hill in the dark. I still can't spin but I have learned something about connecting. Dominga has given me a bit of the cotton to take home. It feels so innocent. It has no weight or bulk to it. It doesn't smell of anything. It's soft. But I think about how it's in the nature of material things to have an immaterial element to them as well, and how you always need to think about both. Cotton has this lightness, this quality of being drawn into fine threads. That is like its magic. Yet it was once picked by slaves. It started the Industrial Revolution. It employed vast numbers of young children. The way most of it is made today spews huge quantities of chemicals into the earth and into the water table. I bounce the cotton on my palm and see that it's not even formed. It's difficult to think that in the history of this cloudy, lot soft, light material, there can have been so much suffering. Thank you. So I, I thought that th that passage would give a sort of flavor <laughs> of the book. Um, and as we discuss it, I think you'll see there's a, there's a lot more in the book besides sort of the travel thing and, and, and so forth like that. But I thought that was that passage covered a fair bit of the ground. And I, I think at this point, what I'd like to ask you, if you could just give us a little bit of your background that would lead again into discussing how the book is organized as well, too. So if you wouldn't mind giving us a, a brief sort of Wikipedia-like <laughs> bio. It um, doesn't have to be in depth, but... Yeah, I've been a journalist for a long time. Um, I, I was... I, most of my time as a journalist was in Hong Kong, where I worked for the South China Morning Post, having had a conversation before that when, obviously, it's always hard to get a job as a journalist and... A, f a friend on the course that I was on said, where would you go if you could go anywhere in the world, work on any magazine or newspaper? And I said, the South China Morning Post in the run up to 97, to the handover to, back to China of, of, of the former territory of Hong Kong. I thought that would be amazing. I'd never been to Hong Kong. I'd never even read the South China Morning Post, but I wrote to them and asked if I could do an internship with them. And they said, no. And I thought, <laughs> I thought that's not how the story goes. So. I mean, I, I don't know, I'm not usually as quite as fixed as that, but anyway, I called them up seven times and he eventually said, you've exhausted me. So I stayed there for 12 years 
<laughs> I, I only came back because I met my husband and um, I came to return to the UK. And um, part of that time was being a reporter. I wanted to report on, I don't know, I wanted to work on a real newspaper reporting on real political and economic and social issues. But also, um, later I was given the job as the arts editor of the South China Morning Post. So I travelled, I travelled all around, both physically and mentally, to, all, to, to cover art. And one subject that I'd always been interested in was colours, was dyes and paints. And that sounds quite boring, but every time colours were mentioned, I would get excited. And um, one day in a bookshop in Melbourne, I found a book that was a big technical book about colours. And I learnt about some of the extraordinary stories. And I thought, I want to find a book on that. There was no book at the time. It was more than 20 years ago. And so I left my job, the best job in the world, and I wrote my first book, which is Colour. Um, and while I was writing that, I went to Afghanistan to find Ultramarine, and I thought, <coughs> Jules, the, the interpreter, said to me, if you can ever find a book about Jules for us who live in Afghanistan, who scrabble to find money and to find information, if you can find one. So I wrote one and I sent it to him several years later and while I was doing both of those books really I found myself interested in fabric in part because fabrics are coloured and traditionally coloured with some of the extraordinary ancient dyes but also because as I was looking at dyes I realised that each um, each fabric has a story um, so that's that's my background, really. I've written. I've also um, spent. Uh, I spent about fifteen years working for a charity that worked with religions, different religions, or internationally on conservation. It was one of Prince Philip's. Um, it was Prince Philip founded it, and it was one of his. He was passionate about the environment, and he was also passionate about how people will only work with the environment if they care and how in some parts of the world working with religions is working with what we care for. And I think that that interest in sustainability also is kind of at a quiet heart of this book. Um, I should mention there that um, in doing the research, discovered that you've written a book with your husband on the subject. It's an, of, it's a, it's an the, unexpected book. book title. Yes, I, I, I had it noted here that I, I can't see it, but it, yeah, it was a, it, uh, there is a, a book on religion and... Yeah, it's called Faith and Conservation, which is not exactly a hooky title, but believe it or not, it was um, it was a World Bank bestseller. The World Bank Bookshop right. <laughs> was like, you wouldn't believe how many how many thousands of books we sold. So, oh, well, yeah, but, it, but it's not a hot title. I'm afraid we don't have it in the shop. <laughs> no, I'm, so not, I'm not surprised. Nor, nor I'm afraid do we have the book on jewels, which unfortunately is uh, out of print. But should you all, you can all sort of make a demand for oh, it. Oh yeah, and, we'll write uh, about it. Yeah, yeah. we get, uh, we'll get a publisher to bring it back out. Um, I, also, I, you know, in researching you, I saw that you had done your degree in social anthropology, which both here in the UK at St. Andrews, but also at William and Mary uh, University in, in Virginia in the States. And I, I thought that was of interest too, given how the book, your books are organized and, and such, because they, as might have been slightly evident in the passages read, there's, there's a, some of it is travel writing it, and some of it is uh, history, and <coughs> some of it is memoir. Uh, but there's overlying that there's a thing in the travel writing that sort of touches on anthropology and such that you, Victoria has gone to these places and, and lived with people there and learned how things were done and such like that, but looking at how these, these things functioned within the culture. And so I was just, uh, I was just thinking that both of those backgrounds, both as the anthropology and the reporting, come... I mean, we were having a conversation for... Anthropo we didn't actually exchange names, but anyway, yeah. you were an anthropologist. and uh, What's your name? Leslie. Leslie. And so Leslie was an anthropologist as well, and we were talking about how... One of the reasons to become an anthropologist is because you love asking questions. You want to know what 
motivates people and how things work sociologically or just anyway how things work between people and um i i think that i mean it so for each of the books there was there was a journey that i really wanted to make that was a hard journey um at least one and for color it was to afghanistan i wanted to go in taliban times in 2000 and 2001 i went twice um, to find the mountains, the blue mountains of Afghanistan. <laughs> For my Jules book, I wanted to, I really wanted to go to Burma to um, to understand some of the <coughs> some of the crises really of Burma, and as Burma was one of the main um, places where Jules, where some Jules came from. I and for here, I wanted to go to make bark cloth because that was one of my great questions. You know bark cloth doesn't sound sounds a bit I've seen it but sounds a bit itchy sounds a bit unappealing um, and yet I knew from my anthropology that it was actually critical it was it was some in some cultures in some societies uh, it's actually a central part of how they organize and also articulate certain things about human relationships so that was my blockbuster for me that was the one that I thought if I can do that journey, if I can go and answer those questions, it wasn't just about journeys, it was about having some really key questions, um, then I think that I would be able to answer some of the questions I had about the book. That sort of speaks to um, something that I picked up on the book as each chapter in the book, well, there's some that connect up, but there's, it starts with bark cloth <laughs> and papa, which is a very much a related thing. And um, but then it, it ends with patchwork, and in between there's uh, chapters on cotton, wool, and then tweed, of course, pashima, sackcloth, which is a bit of a side as well, linen. So mo most of those are involved with making thread, which then is woven, and bark cloth is kind of the an anomalous in that because it's not woven; it's it's a, it's the inner bark of a tree, which is then processed and pounded and, and such like that. Actually, we're going to pass some around. Yeah, here. so a... we'll pass it around, but I'll just stand up and show you first of all, because, shall I, shall I talk about bark? Yes, please. Yes. That's... So it is actually <coughs> the bark of a tree, and the tree is very thin. It's about this thin. So when it's sliced down, um, it's about... Oh, about as wide as this really so this is what it's beaten to but you can see how high the trees are from the ground to where the branches start coming out um, and I'd thought that it was I mean it's badly named really bark cloth can I pass it to you and you could just pass it around um, so bark cloth sounds like it's the bark but it isn't actually the outer bark it's the inner bark it's the bit from the through the tree through which the sap, the blood of the tree comes. So it's actually, it is the part of a tree through which life comes. Um, the center is the core, which is just wood, it's just throw away. So this is the life of the tree. Um, and shall I? Well, that's fine. No, I was just thinking, because again, it's, it's um, a lot of the rest of the book is, is, is around <coughs> in different ways of making thread. And, <coughs> And it just struck me as, you know, bark cloth, again, was a bit anomalous. And it's a bit more akin to leather, in a way. I mean, I think it's places where people didn't necessarily have access to skins, in a sense. And then, obviously, trees would be a substitute for But they for did them. have access to uh -huh. skin. Okay. Um, so there was access to skin and access to animals. Um, but bark cloth, I, I, so that was made by the Mycenae in Papua New Guinea, and bark cloth is, is made right across the Pacific, um, and in each place it has traditionally a sacred as well as a very practical role. So I, I mean, I, there's a chapter about all of the ones, but I, I'll just, yes, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? It doesn't quite smell of anything, but there was a time when um, the, black, uh, the black paint on it, it's called me, um, Absolutely, when it was painted on, the me paint absolutely stank. I mean, it was really like, like, like you know, the sort of 
the deep countryside <laughs> or a kind of like <laughs> or rotten um well, when they're rotten doing the pig pigs. slurry on the exactly. fields pig slurry right, yeah. that's okay. exactly what it smells like Probably. so it might not smell like anything now but once upon a time it did this was made by the mycin they're in Papua new guinea they are the bark cloth makers they trade bark cloth one that's a loin cloth size um a slight uh, it was the tree would have been about um 12 months old and then 18 months old would make a skirt um, for women and um, so one skirt trades for a big pot down down the to to the pot makers and a one of those trades for a small cooking pot um, then there are trades with people who who um, make shell necklaces and several bark cloths a lot of bark cloths for a canoe so there's a whole um, currency and that currency is not <coughs> today that currency is not so much about the trade it's about the connection so if you trade those people with whom you trade those people are people to whom you can speak about things that you might disagree like like uh, hunting rights or marine rights um, and traditionally bark cloth has kept the peace and i was um i was lucky enough to spend um, some time with the mycin i beat this little thin bit of it's like um it's like dough i beat it into wider and wider and wider and that's the sound of the mycin village in the morning you hear it at about five o'clock in the morning it goes bang, 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 bang. <laughs> and you've already had sweeping before i mean there's no sleeping in the mycin village in the morning i can assure you because of all that bang. um and there are different rules and many of the mycin women who are who are older than i guess who were born after say 1965 do not have tattoos mm. but most of the women who were born before 1965 do have tattoos and those tattoos were made when they were 13 or 14 and they're quite startling or they're actually rather beautiful and each of them has a character and it was when i was talking to one woman and she was they'd they'd hung up all of these brilliant um, bark cloths in the guest house the where they where we were staying and um she was talking and then suddenly she as she moved and it was dark and it was just a, a solar lamp that was that was um lighting her i suddenly saw realized how close her tattoos across her face were to the bark cloth patterns mm. that we've we've seen and i asked them and they said ask the elders who are the men um so the men talked about it but there is a story that people came out of the earth a long 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 time ago in a certain place above the river and they came complete with the tattoos and complete with the bark cloth and complete with everything and the patterns and um Addie said that when um, when her tattooing time was come, she volunteered for it. You had a choice, um, but when it but it was seen as the way to be beautiful. <coughs> and the old um, the old aunties <coughs> came from down the bay, and they painted. They looked at her face, and of course there were well, not of course, but there were not really very many mirrors. So they looked at her face, and they painted this cloth pattern on bark cloth. And that is the pattern that she agreed would be on her face. So she saw it really for a long time, only on bark cloth. Um, and I guess the last thing I'd like to say about that with my sustainability hat on is there is something extraordinary about that bark cloth because at the moment they live in an astonishingly beautiful place. It's, it's a beautiful, beautiful place. It's there at the bottom, there, there's, there's, the be there's beach and then there's this perfect and beautifully clean and organized village and then behind it there's a there's a rise and about seven kilometers away there are the gardens where the, where all the food is grown and also the bark cloth trees are cultivated and then behind that there's virgin forest and that virgin forest is threatened right along right 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 through the world really but right in Papua New Guinea all of that virgin forest is being is under threat from um big logging companies and some of them are using underhand methods to get permission to use the forest and some of the methods aren't so underhand it's just money so the people need to have enough money that they don't that they can get 
the medicine and the school books that they need. And it's through selling bark cloth that they can actually get the currency that can save the forest. So it's it's a fabric, mm. and yet it's got organize, organization, it's got sense of beauty, it's got <coughs> trade, it's got peace, and it's got future, all in this old. And it's, they use it for ritual, um, but they really do use it for ritual. And so although normally they just dress in kind of the normal clothes um, of, of all, all around the world, for, for ritual, for feasts, for fun, they'll dress like that. And it's marvelous. It'd be interesting to see if bark cloth goes out into the world and becomes more of a, a thing, both economically and as something that gets used broadly. Because all the other chapters, what you deal with the other chapters, cotton and wool and silk, all of those things have had huge political and economic consequences all through the ages. I mean, cotton certainly could go into quite a lot about that, especially dealing with slaves, but wool in this country used to be the, the wealth of this country, but it had knock-on effects with the Enclosure Acts and, and all the rest of that. And silk, obviously, has had all sorts of political and economic uh, concept, positive and negative uh, as, as well. Uh, whereas bark cloth seems to exist in a nice little <laughs> bubble, I guess because it was never widely ad adapted outside of the areas where people made it. Um, so it'd be interesting to see whether it does become just like everything seems to be getting made out of bamboo now. That um, In the bark cloth chapter, I tell the story about um, Captain Cook and Joseph Banks, who was his naturalist. And um, Banks was quite excited about the potential. I mean, he, was, he was astonished by this cloth that he saw. And in some of the places um, in the Pacific, this cloth, this cloth, that's just one tree. But you can... Like like you can with um, with pastry or something like that, you can you can bash it so that it actually makes this huge um, cloth. So he was he was astonished by this clothing that people wore, and he did think that there could be a possibility. Um, nothing here. Well, you know, perhaps just as well since I said every every time we do get that sort of international <laughs> trade going, there seems to be consequences to it. Uh, which is interesting because in your other chapters go in a, a good deal now also a, a, about the history and such like that. So besides your travel writing cap and your, your anthropology cap, you also have your historian cap. And, um, and I know, how long did it take you to write? It took me a long book? time. It took me a long time. It took me um, uh, six, six years. So I'd say five years, really, because we were looking at um, publishing a year year before, but obviously COVID, um, thank goodness, for the book. Not, <laughs> but, um, <laughs> um, yeah, so it, it, it came out, it came out now rather than then. And in a way, it's been really hard for the book trade coming out during COVID. Well, and, as, as, and as I know, yeah, we can sort of talk about that. But I did, it, it, I felt actually that you probably could have had a couple of books out of this. I mean, just things on cotton make a, a book in itself. Uh, and, <laughs> and, well, yeah, no, I no, mean, no, it's a, I'm laughing because when I was, because it's huge, it's a huge, huge subject. Um, and for the cotton, before, as I sort of sat down, there was some, obviously, some great books about cotton. There's one about King Cotton. And the, the um, author of that book was giving a lecture, which I watched online. And I thought, I'll just see what, what he draws out as the kind of the key things. And he said, he said, well, obviously, cotton is such a huge subject. You couldn't possibly to have done, uh, uh, you know, just one book about it. I just chose a narrow area. And I was like, oh, my God, I have no chance. Well, I did go, I mean, just, just to give an idea of what, what went into this, I did go and I counted up bibliography notes and index for fabric, of which there's 55 pages. <laughs> And, uh, and I, the oh no, font, 64. And, no, sorry. And color, the font was uh, was was reduced as well. Sorry, I I mis I, I misled my notes here. Color was 55 pages. Fabric was 64. Uh, so I think that probably represents a lot of time spent in libraries and a lot of things like that. So, and um, and it it makes for it makes for a fascinating read though. I mean, it's it's like I said the 
the way the book is constructed, it's it's not a, a narrow history. It's it's Victoria traveling these places, immersing herself in, in, in the culture and such like that, and then going back and looking at the historical significance of things. And then again, also there's a memoir part of this, which we could we could talk about as well too, which comes into play with, I said, was bookended by Barcloth and then and then your last chapter, uh, not piecework, what am I saying? Patchwork. Uh, which again is a bit anomalous from the other things because patchwork, as you, we, we would all know, is taking scraps of cloth and sewing them together and then possibly quilting them, but, but generally it's just sewing together of scraps of cloth that things are already woven. But that really, I do think, speaks to the, your overriding arc in this book about... It, which is a metaphor that which, is based on patchwork. Yeah, I mean, if you yeah. could, we could, we yeah. could speak about that, which is so. So for me, um, I I thought about fabric, but I also really aware that it is a massive subject. Um, I hadn't quite realised when I did it, but I mean, you know, for this one, the bookshelf at the time was about this long. The first time I walked into a dedicated textile library, I was like, oh, oh crikey, this is a massive subject. But when it was first mooted by the publisher, I said I didn't think I could do it. My father was ill. He'd been ill for 10 years. He'd had a stroke and then had dementia. My mother was looking after him. Um, I didn't feel there's a lot of there's a lot of work and a lot of travel and a lot of intention involved in a book like this. And I didn't feel that I could be a good daughter and, and a good person. I just didn't feel that I could do two things properly. And I knew that the thing that I wanted to do properly would be to be there for my parents. So my mother said, don't say no just yet. And we all knew <coughs> that that meant that my father was going to die. He was going to die possibly quite soon. And my father said, who had dementia but also lucid, uh, he said, don't say no just yet, because he, he meant the same thing. And um, my mother and I, my mother came up to, to visit, my husband was away, and we went to the American Museum in Bath, which if you know, it's just this splendid museum. And there was a show called Hatched, Matched, Dispatched, and Patched. So the clothing and fabrics that are appropriate to all these key points in um, our cultural life. And uh, it was great, actually. She said we should go. And uh, so we went and it was, it was brilliant. And in the last room, which is the funeral room, there was this great big patchwork, quite actually, it was quite intense. It was sort of vivid, uh, magenta and red. Um, it wasn't a calming patchwork, but it was a patchwork that was made by a widow and her one of her best friends who came up after her husband died and they, they were there for sort of five or six weeks patching and then quilting <coughs> this, this piece. And my mother said, we could do that, you know, when, when Patrick, when your father dies, um, we, could, we could do that together. And um, we could, you know, like when people come to the house, look, there'll be loads of people coming to the house and offering condolences. We could sort of give them something to patch. And then we both laughed because it would have been the worst patchwork in the world. Because my mother, my mother was hopeless. She, um, she grew up without parents. She didn't have a kind of a loving female presence in her life to teach her how to... Um, how to sew or do any of those, knit or anything. And although I grew up with a loving female presence in my life, that, that, that presence had no idea about how to sew. So we would make the worst patchwork in the world and we just thought that would be good, actually, because what do you do when somebody that you love dies? And so we told my father that we were going to do that and he, he thought it was funny as well. So we've kind of sorted something out in a kind of loving kind of way and then my mother died at first it was really sudden it was really pretty awful um and surprising and i was in india and i came back and so all of those things had happened and my father then died three months later but throughout that whole dreadful kind of three month time of it was dreadful after that but i was like where are you we've got to do the patchwork together i want to make this patchwork with you and you're not here and it kind of symbolized really it was a symbol symbolic expression of everything that i'd lost and somehow that was there and then i thought 
I can do the patchwork. It just it has to be my kind of patchwork, which is writing. So that's that was what it was. And so <laughs> as part of the process, um, I wanted to make a patchwork. And as far there are many great patchwork makers, but one of, one of the sort of the great communities, and I'll just show you the end papers, which are, I think, amazing. These are the end papers. Gorgeous end papers. Um, and this, this, this is a um, patchwork made in G's Bend, Alabama, um, by a community of women who by a community which in the 1930s, when the whole of America and much of the world was going through economic crisis, they were going through worse. It was an African-American, it is an African-American community. It was mostly um, cotton. They borrowed in the, um, in the Great Depression. And then the man they borrowed from died and his widow sent the bailiffs in and he sent them to pick everything up that they could. And the people were left with just about nothing, um, with nothing at all really, um, just rags. And it was cold in Alabama in the winter and the women started patching to give them something to wear and something to put on their beds. And the patchwork was astonishing. And that gift of pattern and texture continued through and I wanted to go to G's Bend, Alabama, and I did. And of course I arrived and um, Mary Ann was at the community centre and I said, is there any chance of learning, of, you know, of, of having lessons? And she said, no. <laughs> but then I told, then she said, then I said, can I just have a look around and just hang out? And she said, yes. And she asked me, she said, well, why, what are you doing here? Well, if you, can't, if you can't patchwork, what are you doing here? And I told the story about my mother and about never having learnt. And she was sorry for me and she responded very kindly and she said, OK, I learnt the nine patch when I was six. That was what my mother taught me. I'll teach it to you. So I, we made an arrangement. I stayed for the week and I learnt how to make um, patchwork. And I brought the, um, this is my show and tell number two. <laughs> right, this is, I mean, this is, it's not because it's great, right? <laughs> this is the patchwork that I made and we made it through storytelling yeah, and we did it. So yeah. there's the little yeah. nine patch that we did. Yeah. And this is prison bars and this is courthouse steps and wow. obviously, it just happened that those are the ones she taught me, but of course, prison bars, course house steps. Um, where's, those, the, where's the nine step in there? The nine, here we go. Nine the nine patch. patch. Here we go. So that's nine. nine. Oh, so that's how you squares. start. Okay. Yeah, so you start yeah. going three across six, there. Okay. And one of the things that she showed me, this isn't the only thing that I made, but just this is, this is the best one. Um, but, but she showed me kind of like evenness and unevenness <coughs> and how you make something that is, that coalesces as a whole without it being um, made even. And I think in a way that's what you hope to make with anything really, something that without being even, Mm. coalesces as, as a whole so I suppose it became my own metaphor for what I was trying to do with this incredibly complex wig and is that by hand uh, no um, machine machine yeah so we just made lots and then she was showing me how she put she put it together um, and obviously I was kind of living the sort of the spirit of that of that community center with people popping in and coming to buy things mm. and um, this documentary playing the whole time and it was and there was a moment where I felt that it I understood I understood what I had never it, what I had never experienced before I had understood but not experienced which was the just calm friendliness of people working together on a project that um, yes I mean people who I'd always wanted it and I'd never quite had it, this sort of sense of community that comes from making. Um, and making, of course, can be with fabric or with other things, but um, 
<coughs> it kind of let me into a sort of secret of the world, I think. It's, it's a secret that seems to have been lost in a lot of places. I mean, in, for instance, in, in this country, you had areas where this sort of, I mean, like, like Durham quilting and things like that. There were areas where this, this was a common thing and people got together this way and there was traditions and people, you know, mothers taught daughters and things like that. And it was also part of the, not just the practical necessities of things, but also part of the economic life of these places as well, too. And a lot of that seems to have gone by the by. I know um, <coughs> somewhere I've got a, um, well, it's not, a, it's not quilted, it's just a patchwork with a bit of flannel sewed to the back. Something my maternal grandmother made from suiting material through the depression. Wow. She worked in, as a seamstress in, in the States in, in Brooklyn in shops, I guess. And I, was, I, I expect on men's suits, so she had lots of access to lots of scraps of men wool suiting. So all through my done, so like I said, somewhere in the house. I've got it just squares, you know, blocks of the color. But again, and that wasn't necessarily a community activity. That's just something that she did out of necessity, I think, as much as anything. And then she always, you know, she made clothes for uh, for us. And but there's a yeah. sense of leaving a little bit of yourself in there, isn't there? Oh well, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's certainly, you know, about my grandmother and um, and my mom. You know, my mom learned as well too. I mean, she made her. Um, graduation dress from high school, which my sister has found with a waist about that big. They all had 18-inch waists. Well, you know, it was, it, was before, it was well before six children, I think, is what it was. But, um, but she made that, she made that her, herself. So those, those sort of things seem to have, have been, I, I'm not exactly lost, but no longer had the the currency of the in I agree, and yet I expected when I set out as a journalist um, into this extraordinary area of making, I thought that I would find again and again a disappearance. And actually, I was surprised how often I found either a resurgence or a continuation or a rediscovery by the next generation. I, I was. I was quite surprised, actually, and I think that there's something. I think that there's something about it that makes people want to rediscover it because they find out what it can be. I, when I was when I was a rookie journalist in Hong Kong, um, I wanted to do um, army stories and um, smuggling stories and all of those kind of stories, and so I. Um, and I was able to do some of them, and I worked with um, Joint Services Public Relations, JSPRS, and um, they... And then Roger, who was the JSPRS man, he said, I've got the perfect story for you. And I said, oh, that's so great. What is it? And he said, well, my wife is in a quilting group. And I thought, oh, no, this isn't what I wanted at all. I want... But I owed him a favour, and it's all about building relationships. So I said, OK, I'll, I'll go along. And um, my goodness me, I think it was one of the most extraordinary interviews, group interviews that I'd ever done. Um, although many people said, please don't write this. So some of them said, you can write this. Some, most of them said, you can't. But we sat, and people told me how this quilting and patching, which are two different processes, um, had saved their lives. And literally they'd come, um, there were some um, Hong Kong Chinese women there in the group and some women who'd come as expatriate wives without something to belong to and they felt desperate and um, it had saved their lives. And I, I think when I was starting to talk about this fabric book, I think that story, which I don't put in, in it, um, I think that that was actually at, at a core as well. So I wanted to come to Patchwork. Mm. Um, and also Patchwork was a place for putting some of the stories that are kind of key, but they're not about linen or cotton or whatever. And those are things like Penelope mm. reweaving um, and the much dark, darker story of Philomela, who, um, who in Greek mythology, is um, her sister marries a king, the king comes, uh, the sister wants to see her little sister, the king goes to collect the little sister, finds her very beautiful, 
instead of bringing her home to his wife, um, takes her and rapes her. And, um, and she says to him, unless you kill me, I shall destroy you. So he cuts out her tongue and leaves her in the forest. And she finds a loom and in the loom, she weaves the story of what has happened and as code and this weaving um, is sent to her sister and her sister knows exactly what's happened and exacts a terrible revenge. So that's obviously, it's a story from mythology, but it's also about how women, we can, <coughs> women can find our voices in many ways that are not just words. Um, and fabric is one of the ways that women have traditionally found our voices. Um, and I wanted to say that. Oh no, that's that's it. I, for as I always say, I, I mean, all of us would be familiar. I, I expect with with Penelope too. You mentioned that's Odysseus, is Odysseus's wife, is, is while he's off having his adventures, getting home, <laughs> one one pub to the next, or one island to the next, rather. Um, she's keeping off the suitors who want his kingdom by uh, unweaving his shroud, which he needs to make each time. So that's uh, it. We. And most people are familiar with that. Sort of Penelope is actually the first myth that I ever heard because my parents had a dog that they got when, when my mother was pregnant with me, and they called her. She was a beagle, and they called her Penelope because they thought that it, that they hoped that she'd be faithful. As a Odysseus's dog, dog yes. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so yes, that's that's my earliest remembered myth. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, I think. Um, and I, I hasten to add that we, we talked an awful lot. There's a lot more in the book than we've discussed already. In case you think, oh, well, that's the, that's the book. There's it's a wealth of, of really interesting bits of information in here in the history of it and, and engaging and, and the way in which Tori is engaged with the people that she's gone and visited and, and, and the things that come out that way. So it's, it's like I said, it's, we've barely scratched the, the surface here. Um, I think at this point, um, I could say if anybody has any questions for Victoria, I'd be happy to open her up. Is anybody? Please. Well, but you mentioned about the um, three thumbs bolts. Did you go and see those at Beamish? I didn't them. see those at Beamish. They, they are mentioned, um, and there are some stories about the Darwin quilts, and I didn't know that I could see them at Beamish. But, yeah, so, but I am going to Durham in April, so I shall look them out. So is, is it, an, is it an, an exhibition or a museum? So the Be Beamish is like... Folk um, museum. In, 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 it's a folk in there. Yeah. And I, I used to quilt, and I knew that they had quilts there. And because they had so many of them, they're not... Because I thought it was just like in um, Commander's Hospital. And if you say you're interested, they'll take you behind the work. And, and some of the mm. beds, they've got like ten. And the problem, you know, because I've made them up, and the problem is you've got 80 possibly present bolts, you know, right up to the atmosphere. But they've just got so many that they have enough to store. Can everybody hear? Yeah, I was just going to say, just for the benefit, because I, I, I should say that this is being recorded, so I should have said that before we started, in case anybody is here or shouldn't be here, we'll make sure <laughs> that you're... Um, but that was that was a bit about Beamish Open Air yeah. Museum, which is in the northeast, and it's all built around an old colliery, an open uh, open dr a drift mine, and and they have it's set what 1890s, I guess, is it? That's set about that period. But I think there's also just talking about the Durham quilting. There's um, where is the? Sorry, Kate can tell you. <laughs> The Bose Museum. <coughs> there's a beautiful, oh, well, I'm not sure if it's still on, there's a beautiful exhibition on quilts, the latest acquisitions of Durham quilts, and it's, it's and definitely the And the Bose, the Bose Museum, Museum. The Bo is in a very in famous Bose. place now. Von Art <laughs> Castle. Um, your eyes. So, yeah, there you are. You, you have your eye test at the same time that you, you're up there. But, um, definitely worth a visit if you're in the area. It's a very nice exhibition. Um, in the 1930s, um, I mean, Durham and South Wales were two of the areas that were doing extremely badly financially and economically. And there was a whole um, project to work with the women in the mining cottages to try and help them make 
to help them make their quilts so that they could be sold for large amounts of money to wealthy people in London. And there's a sort of rather marvellous story about um, the woman who made this hay. Um, she was actually also a, um, a detective writer. And uh, she went to visit and she was talking to one of the women as she was on using the quilting frame. And then the door opened and two incredibly coal covered men came in and everybody was aware and they crawled underneath the quilting frame to make sure that not a dot of coal landed on these exquisite white white quilts is uh, uh, uh please yeah I, i've got a couple of quotes what the first one is i wonder how many places cultures you'd actually managed to go to and um you know i personally like an overarching book because i think any of those subjects can need a library so i like something which brings things together but i wanted one how many of these places you managed to go to and the second question i have is that it seems to me that fabric making the making of fabric is largely a female um an expression of a female activity artistic and economic but i wondered what you thought the role if any of men was because i was thinking of tailors and how they stitch together the fabrics that women make. I wondered if you met any male men. In many societies, it was actually I'm men. sorry, if I could just stop for a minute. Did everybody hear those questions? Okay, sorry. Then. No, in many societies, it was actually men who were involved. In, in, um, in Northern Europe, it was men. These, are, these broad loops <coughs> were quite muscular. You had to, if before, before some of the technology improved, you had to be chucking the shuttles through and through. And it was very much the men who were involved mm. and in charge of the looms. Um, so weaving, it, we, weaving, yes. actually weaving, weaving on the looms. So often it was often it was women spinning, and men who were weaving. Mm. There, there were yeah, many so. many occasions mm. that it wasn't. Obviously, um, there was a great deal of invention done for the cultural revolution, for the heat cultural revolution, for the industrial <laughs> revolution, um, mm. and so a lot of that. Um, was in the hands of men who were improving things and looking at the machinery that could do it. Um, your first question, how many? <laughs> my, I'm racing, I don't know. I remember counting for colour and it was 17 um, places, sort of places around the world. I would, I haven't counted, but I would say it's probably similar. Quite a lot of the journeys I was already, because I had, I was running this other job at the same time. Mm. So I would, like for example, I went to Guatemala because I was invited to give a talk in, in Mexico about colour. So it was a kind of simple mm. step. Wonderful, you managed um, to combine. Yeah. So on quite a few occasions I managed to combine. Mm. combine. Um, but I, I think probably about 15 places. Mm. I'm very envious. <laughs> I was lucky, yeah. You said with tweed, um, did you So um, the question, question was... the question about beating tweed. Yeah. So uh, I didn't see the beating of tweed because at the mo because right now, because tweed is... I went to Harris and I, um, I met a weaver and there's lots of rules about <laughs> what makes Harris tweed and you've got to be at home. Interestingly, the single, the single looms, um, which are entirely, um, well, <coughs> you treadle, but it's much more, um, much less mechanized. Those are often women, not always, but often women who are doing that. The double looms on Lewis and Harris, um, those are, again, often men. Um, they're, they're bigger, more expensive looms. They involve kind of more work and money. Um, and also that was a big uh, employer of fishermen, for example, who had, needed to find work so so on those things um did i see the beating no i didn't um i talked about the beating it's done mechanically now uh, but also i i did a talk on women's hour um in uh, december and the producer gave me a link to a program that she'd she'd produced a few years back on the walking songs so that's the process w-a-u-l-k-i-n-g so that's the process of turning these and beating the cloth you need to um 
when cloth is done on certain kinds of looms, um, it can be uneven. So you need to kind of have a way of, of evening it up and it's done by fulling, which is like, like the process of felting. Anyway, she's, the link she sent me was for rude walking songs <laughs> in the Hebrides. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I do recommend if anybody Googles it, it was done in about 2016, it's very funny. You can't do any for us now. Though, <laughs> uh, or, uh, this is Harris Street, if she passes around is also showing and tell, you know, this is my waistcoat. Um, I was admiring it, by the way. Yeah, I was wondering it's, whether it was Harris. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's, uh, for the occasion. <laughs> Perfect. Really Good to see. Out. Yeah. Um, is there any further questions? Please. Yeah. For the baby subject, did you come to die? Um, that, so sorry, there was a question, question about dying in the book. Sorry. sorry, sorry That's all right. Please. Um, do you know I don't cover dying so much, and in a way, I mean this. This was as big as my publishers would allow it to be, right? This is 150,000 words plus the bibliography, blah, blah, blah. So, um, and initially what I gave them was 200,000 words. And, but I knew that it had to be cut back. It's just that I didn't, you know, it was, it was so much. And I did do here, I talked about indigo and cochineal okay. and things like that. So although I had one in the initial kind of like, how am I going to approach this book? There was to be a whole chapter on dyes. I felt that in a way, although it's the most brilliant subject, to be fair on myself, um, I should concentrate on some of the fabrics, not on the dyes. But I mean, I think it's it's brilliant, and I do I, I do mention them as as often as I possibly can. So, but some of those those mentions were in the fifty thousand words that have have gone. <laughs> I just oh sorry, please yes. What's the, what's your plan for your next? Oh, that's one of my questions. <laughs> Thank you. That was that question was what what Victoria's plans are for her next book. Thank you. So. This took me six years, and I was, you know, what I realise is that I can't, that I've got to do, I've got to have lots of questions that I want to answer, rather than doing a book that I can write. There's an exercise that you do that you sort of say, all right, so before you do the next book, what do you want people to say about it? And I realised that there's one phrase that I want people to say about the next book, which is, um, a slim volume. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is I've got a couple of ideas, um, but I'm I've given myself until the spring before before going before going on to the next there. thing. Yeah. Well, as in, as in they now. need they, they need to they need to germinate, so they're yeah. they're on the windowsill at the moment. Given but a slim volume on something will be produced. <laughs> Actually, we didn't we didn't. I mean, you mentioned it a bit. We haven't really talked too much about your book on color, which is again. And interesting, and it's, it structures a bit similarly, as it were. Mm -hmm. But I, I found it fascinating on a couple of levels. I mean, one is a, a, as, as a trained artist and a painter, someone had an art practice for a lot of years. There's a lot of things, in a sense, I already knew, but there was background things about where these colors actually came from and, and some of the processes in it. But it was also things that was, oh, you know, that's, yeah, I kind of knew that, but I knew it on a different level, as it, as it were. Um, but again, if you have any, I mean, color is something we we all have surrounding us as we make decisions, all kinds of decisions uh, in our lives having to do with color and it represents all kinds of things for us. It's a little bit different than the fabric one because fabrics are kind of necessary and color is a sort of added thing. Oh, colors, color is... Is color necessary? <laughs> Discuss. But you're right, it's an interesting one. I, in a way, it's a luxury, and yet, and yet we keep looking for it, don't mm. we? Oh, and sure. we're attracted yeah. to it. I mean, actually, that was something that I didn't quite get into, is, which is uh, oh. a, about the title of your book, Fabric. Because you think fabric and, and you think cloth and textile, but they're not really quite synonymous. You think about cotton fabric or wool fabric but I mean fabric is is in a sense a thing that's made or a thing that exists somehow so you have the fabric of space and time um, so it's like I said while we think oh fabric we're talking about cloth we're talking about textile we're talking about a particular kind of fabric as it were so I was just wondering if I mean, you, if you made any decisions that yeah. way about titling the book I did make decisions about titling the book I think I mean as I was writing the book, 
I found it really hard to work actually and I th and kind of <laughs> I watched two or three deadlines <laughs> whizzing past um, but I realized that one of the reasons that I wasn't able to write this book about fabrics so easily was that I thought that I was the same person who'd written colour and I wasn't anymore. Mm. I was actually, when I looked at myself, I was a woman grieving. I'd lost my parents and I'd thought that you can just kind of, and you can often, I mean, in, in other writing and things like that, you can just take that out of it and say, this is it. But in fabric, what is the important thing about fabric? I mean, apart from the fact that, you know, it, it dresses us on one level, but it does so much more, doesn't it? It's where, it's what we dress our dead in. It's what we, how we mark something that is really critical, rite of passage. It's what, what interested me is that fabric is also the thing that you, that wraps secrets. It wraps, it's, there's, there's things that you're looking under fabric to find. And I became interested, I suppose, because I was in that, that particular time of grieving that we all have to go through ordinary grieving. It was grieving of things that had happened in the right way round. It wasn't extraordinary, but it was still very hard. Um, you think about what, what makes us material and using that as a metaphor, I wanted to look at that. I wanted to look at material and material worlds and the, the immaterial things. Mm -hmm. And I found that that was the only way that I could write the book. So for me, that it had to be te it had to be fabric, not textiles, because the I hope that I'm not heavy about it, but there is a lot of metaphor in that and a lot of exploration. And I hope really <coughs> that it's also about what it is to be human. I mean, the when I was told that this was going to be the cover, they actually sent it to me as the original fabric that it's that it is a picture of was the the fabric is in the V&A &A and it is a madder <coughs> dye right so that means that it's kind of um yeah it's a kind of dark pink red kind of color and I looked at this and I thought well I love the fact that she's got a sort of cigarette coming out of her mouth that's made with the with the thing but who are these people who even are these people that are going on the front of my book and I thought well I need to know because if they were it looks uh 18th century if they were people who were engaged in slavery then I don't want it on my book I think that um, I want to really make sure that 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 we've got a good sense of this and it's actually um, it's a book called Paul and Virginia Paul and Virginie um, it was the Robinson Crusoe the 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 bestseller of France um, it was popular among the revolutionaries uh, Napoleon said, he told the author, that he used to sleep during his Italian campaign with, um, with a copy of it under his, under his um, bed. It's the story um, under his pillow. I mean, he told Thomas Paine that he, that he did the same with his book, so maybe he had a lot of <laughs> books stacked <laughs> under his head. But nevertheless, it was a critical book, and it's the story about th this. This picture um, shows two young people, it was really in the book, it's children. But it's it's the story of two children who grow up on Mauritius. They um, they grow up as brother and sister, but they're not brother and sister. They have um, they have they're the children of two single mothers, and they grow up in this idyllic place. And they they run their their mothers spin cotton. They they run around, and as they grow up a little bit, they fall in love with each other. Um, they they rescue unsuccessfully but they rescue a slave woman um, and they they are these people who and eventually she goes off to Paris she she has these these clothes brought out to her and she is so civilized with clothes that when she tries to return to Paul um, there's a shipwreck and she can't take off her clothes she is so civilized that it kills her and there is a sort of sense that um, that this is the Adam and Eve story. This is the story of how we grow up from, from being simple to being sophisticated and how often, if not always, the clothes that we wear are the metaphor and the actualization of becoming grown up and then becoming, 
I don't know, becoming adults, but also maybe losing track of something that we had. So I think that it's quite sort of a powerful image and it's one that I wanted to show in this book. And it's on the tea towel that the camera <laughs> <doesn't know. laughs> Organic. Very, very organic <laughs> um, yes, please. Can I ask what do you think the difference is between fabric, textile and cloth? Because it obviously made a difference to your selection of the title. Fabric is more open to the metaphor, isn't it? I mean, cloth is cloth, whereas fabric is something that is made. So it goes back to origin much more. Right. Um, textile, well, textile has got the same kind of origin as text. It's a bit pretentious. It's a bit more modern. And also, honestly, I'm not sure whether I would pick up a book called Textiles. Yeah. Um, not, not that I've got anything against that, but I'm just thinking that it does. It, the book is about that, the history of textiles. I mean, it was interesting, actually. Once I, I go to Paisley, um, which to find out why the Paisley pattern, which is a Kashmiri pattern, which is a different kind of ancient pattern. But, you know, why does it come from Paisley? And, and I arrived quite late from the airport and I, I don't know, it was only a mile and a half and I saw this kind of line of taxis waiting and I just thought, oh, it's so mean of, you know, it's so mean somebody spent an hour waiting and they're going to get a one and a half mile thing from me. And I thought that was kind of unfair to a working person um, to do that. So I set off the walking the one and a half miles to Paisley in the dark through an industrial estate with kind of like, <laughs> cars going slowly and it was just quite sort of and I was listening to I thought I'm good, I'd better listen to something to kind of concentrate my mind on being safe and I was listening to Desert Island Desert, which happened um which happened to be about um uh Linda McCartney <coughs> and how she uh, how you can do fashion as well um without any leather or fur and I just thought right I'm going to do my book with no mention of leather or fur or anything and I think I made it you know, a couple of times I've used it as a metaphor of what something mm -hmm. felt like um, but but that I suppose would come into the textiles but not so much the fabric so I preferred it I thought it was it felt more ethical to me even though I don't think textiles is an unethical word it's just a more complicated mm -hmm. word I, I just think it, it's quite interesting with modern technological developments how things that might be used as fabric are now being fabricated and you know are dislocated from this kind of female or male energy and producing and uh, interacting and all the symbolism and the social meaning of the fabric you know I'm thinking of the this new mushroom uh, textile which is brilliant for me as a vegetarian you know I can get rid of my leather boots and it, you know if you, but it's uh, made in a lab so we're entering a whole different world of it's, it's which is also fabric isn't it in terms of fabricated yes, exactly um, even if it's um, uh, wearable, pressed mm -hmm. is everybody is everybody hearing this so, mm -hmm. yeah. okay yeah I mean they're amazing fa fabrics made of mushroom and pineapple well, and banana yeah, and, and Fabric is, as if we think about it, fabric is always a much more inclusive thing. So other things tend to be adjectival applied to it. So you have you have steel fabric, you know, which is a completely different thing. And you have fabric, as you say, the fabric of our lives, as it were. So you wouldn't necessarily the textiles of our lives or the cloth of our lives. So fabric is this much broader sense, isn't it? Which is the reason I asked the question is because I thought, you know, you could have called it cloth or textile, but fabric just seemed to 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 hint at more. And also I suppose as a writer you want to you want to give yourself freedom yeah. to explore and that, that was a bit more generous to me as the writer. <laughs> <laughs> well it's, it's a it's a much more broader and, and inclusive term. Um, as um, it, we, I could there's time for a question or two more if anybody had oh, yes yes sir. Uh, yeah I was just wondered about the sustainability challenges with the fabrics and how much of it is sort of historical looking at existing sustainability challenges or how much of it is future looking? <coughs> I'm just going to say, just so you can say, it's, it's a question about sustainability and as in, in uh, which 
Victoria will start talking about, but the gist of it was was looking at sustainability both in the past and and present. So paraphrasing, yes. I mean, I suppose in each chapter, but without trying to kind of do it as a sort of boring summing up, there is a sense of uh, asking the question, at least internally, about the sustainability. I mean, the I think one of as well as the bark cloth, which is one of my favourite stories because it is an entirely sustainable fabric. Um, cotton, it's a very complicated chapter because it moves us from the simple cotton of mythology in Guatemala and in North America um, through this kind of awful, awful history and through the Industrial Revolution and through many inventions. But the last invention in the book is um, probably my favourite, even though it's the least impactful. But it's, um, it's a woman, it's the only invention made by a woman. Her name's Sally Fox, and she um, specialist in entomology. And she was given these seeds for cotton. And she was told that, that the cotton it made was very short staple. So the staple in fabrics is always important because it depends how much you can spin it, how flexible it is. Um, so it was short staple, so you could only um, spin it by hand. You couldn't spin it by machine. That's what she was told. And she didn't know anything about um, seeds. She knew about insects. So, so she kind of bred these, these, these seeds <laughs> in ways that any plant breeder could tell you you couldn't do. And she did. So she made these brown seeds, traditional North American cotton, and she made organic cotton. She made organic self-dyed, I mean, it's its own color. So on some occasions, she found that the genetic um, underlying mix came up with something that was pink or green. Um, I saw the green one and she said that there is a blue there somewhere but she hasn't found it herself so suddenly you know by interbreeding um, and it's organic cotton it's long staple it her business was successful and she grew too fast and then it failed which is the story of cotton growing too fast failure but she started up again and she's making sustainable, organic, beautiful, self-coloured. Um, so khaki is the natural colour of some cottons, but it's been bred out. So to get khaki cloth again, mostly you have khaki dyes that are dyeing bleached cotton. It's kind of crazy. So this is kind of saying we can find the chino colour in without any dye. So I like that one. I think that she's the only one that was really trying to slow things down. And maybe it's a bit of a celebration of that. Is, uh, is any further questions? No? Um, well, I think that was, that was quite lovely. Thank you very much. Thank you for all the questions. <laughs> be here for a little bit and 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 sign copies of, of the book and chat a bit more. Thank you very much. Cheers. Yeah.